praise the lord and i would like to take this opportunity to invite my wife uh, her name is shalini shiju and uh, she is going to share her testimony and we were praying the last whole week god let it be a blessing for someone today and if you came here today with any kinds of uh, sickness or prayer or concern in your heart i pray that this is going to bless you i pray that holy spirit is going to speak to you today hallelujah can we raise our hands give glory to the lord hallelujah 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 please come here praise the lord church um before i go into my testimony i would like to read psalms 116 psalms 116 i love the lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy because he inclined his ear to me therefore i will call on him as long as i live the snares of death encompassed me the pangs of sheol laid hold on me I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death. my eyes from tears my feet from stumbling i will walk before the lord in the land of the living i believed even when i spoke i am greatly afflicted i said in my alarm all mankind are liars what shall i render to lord for all his benefits to me i will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the lord I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have loosed my bones. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst O Jerusalem praise the Lord I thank and praise God for giving me this opportunity to share my testimony before all of you my name is Shalini and um this Sam's is very true every single word we read today in psalms 116 is true in my life as i share my testimony you will understand why i read psalms 116 um i was born and raised in kerala india um as the oldest daughter of three uh, three daughters to my parents um I was born and raised in an orthodox Christian family. Um my parents were spiritual religious. Um I was a smart kid. You know, you can say the apple of the eye for the entire family and that's how I grew up. Uh I had a wonderful childhood. Uh my parents had high expectations on my life because I was smart. Um and um there was a lot of expectations. Um that's all i can summarize right now um in 2001 when i was 18 um i was going through difficulties in my body i started having sme- swelling in the left side of my cheek and also some swelling on my right side i was taken to the doctors and uh, um they could not find anything they thought that it's mums you know people back in india they know um you know when it's like summer time some people have mums and so they thought that's that was it i was in a, my 12th grade uh ready to write my final exams and so the doctor gave me medicine and said um you know just take this medicine if it's mums uh, the swelling will go down um if it doesn't go down just come back after your exams are done um and sure enough i took the medicine and uh, um you know it subsided and we never went back to the doctor because i was completely okay and then i joined for my undergraduate study i had um i had taken computer science as my main and i was in my first semester um middle 
the first semester this started coming back again i started having swelling on and off and my parents of course were very concerned and started lo- losing a lot of weight um so my college at that time was in a hill top and you know we had to back in india right we would we would go on a private bus and then we would uh, you know get down on a stop and there was a like like a 1 km 2 km distance to walk and it was like a hill so all of us friends were losing weight so we thought it's just that and so but my parents were concerned because the swelling would not subside once it comes down we showed many doctors they could not find they did a lot of tests on me um sometimes i would get fever um sometimes um you know you know i was not so well but it was like always um the swelling was always there on my face and so they could not figure out they did multiple tests and the only thing they could find out what's my esr was 78 where it had to be somewhere between i think 0 to 10 or something like that so they could not find out why my esr was so high so the doctor said there is some kind of infection but we are not able to find out what it is so my do- my um, you know parents took me to uh, good hospitals they could not find out long story short um, when i was in the second semester so it was almost one year since i've been taking antibiotics different medicines sometimes it would subside but it would not fully go and um It reached a point where one of our friends recommended why don't you take her to a medical a medical college in um Kottayam so they my dad took me to the medical college and the doctor there because they were saying maybe it's something about hormones she's just 18 so maybe there's some problem with the hormones uh maybe there is some mess up there so let's find it out so like that they took me there um and the doctor there recommended for an x-ray of my chest and uh, my dad came with me because my parents own a business back in india they have a shop um so both my parents could never come along for any kind of events because one person had to manage the shop so my dad took me and um we went to take the x-ray and the x-ray technician called my dad aside and said your daughter is very sick if you want her alive you have to take her somewhere immediately so he could not understand what was happening so he said when the chest x-ray is done the gland in my chest which is you know we can hardly see the gland inside a chest okay so the ch- one of the gland has become so big like a big inflated balloon and the other one is also big so he said there is some problem and your daughter is extremely sick i don't know what it is but you have to take her immediately somewhere otherwise you will not get, get, get her alive so my dad panicked i did not know any of these things they never told me um and the doctor had seen the report so the doctor said so all what i'm saying i did i came to know about all of these things what my parents later on they did not tell anything to me because i was so young and they did not know how to break the news to me so um the doctor said to him you have to take her somewhere she's either having tuberculosis or she's having breast cancer um so either or we have to do further tests to clarify what is what my parents were heartbroken i'm the oldest um of three children 18 um and in 2001 i don't think kids of my age we did not know anybody had you know severe like breast cancer or things like that it was traumatic and uh, um my parents personally grieved among themselves because they could not tell us or my sisters because we were very we are a very close knit family they broke down my mom would say there were days they would make food and they would not eat and they would throw it out because they could not eat because they were that heartbroken and i did not know anything and all of a sudden our family friend um so my initial years of education was done in musket because my dad was um dad had a, a job there so we had a very close family friend who was in the city of trivandrum uh, we were just like family and all of a sudden they called and uh, you know um you know people get busy with their lives so we always don't call each other but all of a sudden auntie called and she said she called my mom and asked you know just just 
um, simply, you know, how are you all doing? It's a long time and things like that. So my mom said, you know, we're going through some difficult times. This is what is happening with Shalini. And so, um, you know, she told her husband who had contacts with many doctors at that time in that place. So he immediately called my dad and said, just fax all the results you have. And, uh, you know, I will take an appointment here and the best doctors are here because it's a capital city of Kerala. So why don't you come here? If it's tuberculosis, we have the best options here. If it's cancer, we have regional cancer center, Trivandrum. Um, you know, there are all kinds of doctors there and it's just for the cancer treatment. Why don't you bring her here? I still remember um, it was August 18th, 2001. It was my younger sister's birthday. And my dad immediately said, you have to pack. We have an appointment with my with our doctor um, in Trivandrum. So it's almost like three and a half hours drive from the place I leave by road. Um, so I said, you know, uh, you know, we were thinking of uh, cutting the cake when my sister comes back from school. I mean, she'll be back from school. I went to cut the cake. She said, no, we don't have time for all of those things. So I don't know what's happening behind the scenes when my parents were already panicking because they wanted to know what's happening. Um, I remember seeing her coming from school and we, we left immediately. Um, and uh, my father would say, you know, he took one of my cousin brother to drive because he could not drive. And um, I think they covered the distance of three and a half hours with two and a half hours. They were traumatized. They had to just take me and diagnose, you know, the doctor had to diagnose what was it. Um, I was seen um, by doctor, I don't know, people back in Kerala knows this doctor, he's very famous, he's a very famous oncologist. His name is Dr. V.P. Kangadharan. And I was talk taken to his home. Both of um, him and his wife are famous oncologists, but the peculiarity of their whole house is that usually um, when you have private practice and you see a doctor at homes, they have boards written about their speciality and the names and things like that. Maybe because he's an oncologist and many many people are brought there without knowing actually what their disease is. Maybe because of that, they don't have any name plate there. They just have their house name and that's that. So it just looks like a normal home. You don't know what you're coming there for. So um, he saw me and... Uh, um, he told me to just go and sit with his wife as he talked with his to to my dad and um, all he wanted to make sure was what was the state of cancer i had he said it's lymphoma to my bear uh, to my dad and he said there's two kinds of lymphoma there is hodgkin's lymphoma and non hodgkin's lymphoma it's a cancer to the lymph nodes he said if it's non hodgkin's she has just days to survive um, if it's Hodgkin's, he said, maybe we can do some treatment and see what comes to them. My father was heartbroken. I never knew anything which happened. And so um, then everything was immediate. My doctor was traveling that night. Um, that's why they rushed me to see him. He was traveling that night for a conference and he would be back only the next week. So what he did is that he immediately um, scheduled me for a biopsy on Monday. His wife took care of it and everything from there was fast. Um, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma third stage um, at the age of 18 going to 19 um, in 2001. And um, I went through chemotherapy and radiation. Um, they said that I had to go through 12 chemotherapies and 15 radiations. Um, and uh, um, though my parents did not tell anything to me, you know, as I was doing my treatment, I stayed in this family friend's home. And my dad's sister is here in California. And my uncle there, the family friend uncle, um, he had all the conversations he recorded from the doctor and uh, the details of my diagnosis in one of his computers. And um, I was looking something, browsing something to the computer, and I found a folder which said, um, uh, you know, my name and something else. So I had, you know, you're curious. So I just opened it and I found out and read through all of my diagnosis. So I'm a person at 19 who took the treatment knowing that life was very short and my knees went upward and that I had cancer. It was so hard to accept 
the severity of the diagnosis and that I just had days to leave. I was like a butterfly ready to fly with so many dreams and all of a moment, all of my dreams were shattered. I did not know I would leave the next day. One thing I took care, I tried to take care of that. I knew my parents were heartbroken. I knew my sisters were heartbroken. I know my grandparents were heartbroken. We are a very close-knit family. I knew both my dad's and mom's side of the family. Everybody was heartbroken. And so I knew I had to stand as a pillar of strength, even though I went through a lot of grief and pain. I did not know how to do it. I didn't know what to do. I went through the chemotherapy. I started my first chemo in September of September 28, 2001. And back in those days, chemo was very hard. I'm not saying chemo is not hard now. Science was not so developed at that time. My chemo was just one hour, but I threw up the next three days. I lost all my hair. The hair you see on my head is all the hair which grew back later. My nails were all bluish black. It was very hard. And I remember after the chemo that I would throw up every one minute. Everything I drink would just go exactly into the stomach and come out exactly outside. The physical pain, the mental pain I went through was difficult. And I asked, Lord, where are you? Where are you in all these things? And when people said that you will die, I believe, just like how the Sabbath says. And in midst of all of those things, I knew my mom and dad gave a lot of importance to the spirituality they were in. And so I knew that prayer was an option. So there were days I would cry and weep after everybody would go to bed, hours and hours. I did not know what to speak. I did not know what to pray, but I would cry and cry till 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. It is at that time I was introduced to Jesus Calls Prayer Ministry back in Trivandrum and I was taken there to be prayed and it was the first time in my life I have seen people praying for somebody else's problem with a lot of burden. It was a different experience for me. I'm like, who are these people? How can people pray like that? I was born and raised in a traditional Orthodox Christian family where, you know, you go, you attend the Mass. It's very similar to the Catholic. You attend the Mass and that's that. How do you pray for someone with all the burden when they are not blood related to you? You are seeing them for the first time. How do you do it? I know now how to do it. Right? Because when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ and when you accept him as your personal savior, that makes you children to the kingdom of God. And when you are a child of God, all other people who come to you for prayer, you see them through the lens of how Jesus sees them. You don't see them if they are blood related, you don't see them by their color or how they look or what language they speak. You see them just like how Jesus sees them. And I am thankful for the prayer the people prayed for me. And um, so it was a consolence for my heart. And uh, that is, it gave me strength and it, it allowed me to come closer to God. Um, the, the family I lived with, my um, family friend we lived with, I did all my treatment there. They took good care of me. Um, I would say they were like my second parents. Um, God provided them for me in that city with a purpose. And I remember they were Hindus and uh, auntie would take me to all the Hindu temples and places like that. I went to every place with her. I went to all the churches which people said because that, you know, it is a person who is at the end of their life and everything people say that would save you, you would go there because that's your last hope 
right? And I went and tried everywhere, though I was going to Jesus Calls Prayer Tower. And somewhere in the end months of 2001, it came to my realization, and now I believe that it was the Holy Spirit. That is, there is no salvation in no one else other than in Jesus Christ. It was one day afternoon when I was sitting in the room by myself thinking about my life and thinking about all what I did to save myself. It came to my realization that there is no salvation in anyone else other than in Jesus Christ. I knelt myself in that room and asked the Lord, Lord, I submit and surrender my life at your feet. And never again, I will follow anybody else other than you. Because I know that you are the only one who can save my soul from eternal death. I submitted my, my life to the Lord and, and I told him, Lord, if it's your will, I want to leave for you. If it is your will that it's my, my time is over, I want to leave all the days of my life according to your will. And that was my submission and surrender. And you would ask me, was I completely healed at that time? No, I was not. I went through all the 12 chemotherapies and the 15 radiation. And in many times in my life, I asked Lord, Lord, I hear testimonies of people who are completely healed. Why can't I be completely healed as I accept you? And in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So everything that happens in our life, instant healing, not instant healing, everything, it happens because God has a purpose in our life. Today, I stand before you and say, if I would have not gone through the chemotherapy and radiation, which I would have not, I could not have known the Lord in a very personal uh, way, which I have known him through that journey of mine. And I thank and praise God that I had to go through all of those because I have, I, I have grown in the Lord because of all what I went through. In 2002 of April, I was done with all my treatment and um, the doctor said that I was completely healed and uh, God completely healed me from the cancer. And then I was doing my BSc computer science at that time. And because of some side effects of the chemo I had, I had to discontinue my, um, I had to discontinue my, key, you know, BSc computer science and then uh, continue with my BBA. Um, and then I, I uh, went on, God helped me to take an MBA and uh, um, never uh, coming to the Lord um, and having cancer and healed from cancer. I've never prayed for my marriage because I thought that that was something impossible, especially in a culture and a community like ours. It is not easy for somebody to accept a person um, who had cancer and healed from cancer, even though you're a believer. And but um, like I said in Romans chapter 8, 28, when, you know, when we love God, all things work together for good. And in 2006, when I was doing my third semester MBA, um, you know, the proposal came from my husband's family. You know, um, we are a little distant related. Our, our uh, moms are distant related. And they knew everything and God had spoken to his heart at, they came with a proposal and God had spoken to my heart that he would provide also, though I was not praying for a marriage. And that's how we got married in 2006, December 28. We are married for 16 years by God's grace now. And um, we came to this country in 2007 um, for his job. Um, and we came together and one thing many people because you know our our homes are close by so you know how back in India people talk right so people had talked uh, you know told him many times that you know she's a good girl it's a noble thing you're doing um, but you know she went through all these chemo and radiations and all these things who, the, who knows if she won't get cancer again who knows that you will have children because she went through all these 
things you know she might never bear a child for you and he stood by the decision he took because he said that god spoke to me and i'm going to stand by what god had inspired me um and we came here um and then we started praying to have a child and we waited for three and a half years before i conceived um and after a lot of prayer um, i had difficulty conceiving and um when um in 2010 we came to know that i was pregnant with triplets um i will i got pregnant with um three boys and a girl and we were so excited the church was so excited because so many people were praying our family was excited and uh, my husband um was so excited that he went and brought a van we had a car you know we was just a couple he was so excited he went and brought a van and uh, all of those things happened at 16 weeks when i went for a check up in university of michigan they checked my cervix um and they said your cervix is shortening and um where ladies here you know it's, it has to be 3 plus above centimeter it was less than close to like 1 cm for me already in 16 weeks they said you will have the babies any time and you know 16 weeks weeks if you deliver babies won't survive of course so they stitched me they did a cervical stitch on me to prevent premature uh, delivery send me back home and told that you have to be on complete bed rest and we did that we came back at 18 weeks um like 17 plus week and they said that the cervix is again shortening we have to stitch you again so they stitched me again and the second time they stitched we don't know what happened procedure was longer and it was so painful i am a person who tolerates a lot of pain the pain was so excruciating they had to give me morphine and they they said you know you're carrying triplets we had to circular so it's normal and all those things and they said everything is fine after two days they discharged me home 2010 in the month of october we came back home and i was complaining of intense back pain but if you ask me where it is i don't know it's in the lower back but i don't know exactly to point out where it is i was telling him i could not stand i could not sit i could not lay down the pain was so excruciating and he called the triage they said you know give her tylenol put hot water bag put benge heat pad all the the benge 8 hours heat pad he would put it would last for half an hour for me and then the pain is excruciating he said like, this is too much and then we kept on calling him this is what they said we stayed like that for 3 days and um i remember it was a tuesday and his friend and family came to see us with a with some food they were talking and they said you know i had some vitamins to be picked up so they went to pick up the vitamins and as we were talking i started shivering and then when he looked my fever was going to 101 and 1 two and then he called the doctors and they said give her tylenol and motrin he said no i'm bringing her in you know so you know when you're raised born and raised in india you don't get the concept of 911 so fast you know um even though you're here so we just he just took me to the hospital and just to put a sweater on me because it was fall you know october we are cold here um it took him half an hour because i am literally shivering i cannot stand and just shivering so badly he somehow managed to me managed to put me in the car and we rushed to university of michigan we reached there they started taking the vitals um when they took the vitals uh they found out my that my blood pressure was 70 by 40 and they are thinking that the apparatus is wrong because it is so low i don't know if anybody of you are in the medical profession so 70 by 40 is a very 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 low blood pressure and so um they they started checking they they thought their apparatus is wrong so they tar- started changing the apparatus till my blood pressure is 70 by 40 they started taking on themselves no problem just with me it's 70 by 40 so within an hour so they understood it now it's crucial and so they started rushing they started doing so many things and um you know within an hour 
I was showing symptoms of sepsis. My heart rate went uh, very high and my blood pressure was very low. So long story short, if he would have decided to keep me home at that night, like they said, I would have been dead by next morning. And uh, within an hour in the hospital, they had to call code blue. They had to rush me to the, C the critical care ICU. And uh, I was ventilated for 10 days in the ICU. My blood pressure was 70 by 40. It was dropping down and my heart rate was in 160s. My ejection fraction of my heart was somewhere between 15 and 20. It was in such a rate that I could have a cardiac arrest anytime. My numbers were all so high and I was starting to get difficulty breathing. And um, they told me, you cannot breathe on your own. So we are going to ventilate you. So I asked, what about the children? They, so the CCU people are not take, thinking about the children anymore because they have to just rescue me, right? Um, they immediately called my gynecologist. The gynecologist came and um, um, to the ultrasound and they said, um, one of the baby doesn't have heartbeat and the other two are very feeble. That's my last memory. I held his hand and I cried and I asked why? Why Lord, why is this happening? And I cried aloud. That's all I remember for the next 10 days. I was, the rest of the information I'm giving is what I heard from my husband. I was very critical. My dad came from India. My aunt who is in California, she rushed out. Our church prayed. I'm thinking many of you would have prayed if you were here. I think all over United States, the prayer request was on because the doctor told him, we cannot give you an update for a day. It's hourly. We do not know how she will do the next hour. I was so critical, battling with life and death. The church prayed. My parents prayed. My family prayed. And um, saints around the world prayed prayed and if you see me alive today it is because the Lord came into that room touched me and healed me and took me out of death he would always tell me people who come to that CCU are either better than for the rest of their life or they go dead and I think I'm one of the blessed people who came out of there alive I was in ventilator for 10 days we lost all the three children they took them out when i was you know out in ventilator um, i was highly infected with e coli bacteria because of the procedure they did to me um, it was one of the medical mistakes it came through one of their instruments and um, i came awake after a lot of prayer after 10 days and then I was in the hospital for the next two days they had to monitor administer 56 doses of antibiotic to just get out of the E. coli from my system um, I still carry a mitral valve leakage which I got from the whole of it um, which they cannot do anything so um, what I meant to say is that in all of those things I have seen the hand of God come in and how miraculously he had worked in and through my life and I'm thankful for a church and I'm thankful for a family who prayed and interceded for us in midst of all these trials and difficulties we face through mothers who have children you would know how it is to carry a child and not see their face I got up after 10 days and I asked, the first question I asked my husband is, where are our children? He told me, you were so sick, we could not do anything. I never cried because everybody told me that he suffered for the 10 days, you know, seeing all this, he had to take many decisions, you know, all of those things. He was 28 when he had to see his wife battling with life and lost all the three children. You know, my father was there, but none of his parents or his family is here. 
and i think if we were not believers and if we would have not come to know the lord i think we would have not never survived and i stand here as a testament of god's great faithfulness and his unconditional love which carries you like the bible says even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i shall fear no evil it's not because i am strong enough it's because the one who stands with me is more than able to carry me through the storms and through the fire and i never wept in those days i held all of my emotions and sure enough it took another one year for me to recover from the trauma of losing the children and the doctor said it will be difficult for me to conceive again they said if i conceive with multiples we will have to abort one child because i would not survive or the children would not survive and after one year we came to know that i conceived twins and the doctor i think for the first four months she advised me why don't we abort one child it will be safe i said no no both are my children we will not carried them um at you know because of the complications of my um cervix and the complication of the heart condition i got from the first pregnancy they were born at 24 weeks as extreme preemies jeremiah was 910 grams joanna was 680 grams so you know how small they were and the doctors told me told both of us that they might not survive if they survive when our son had a brain bleed they said he were, he might have cerebral palsy he might have down syndrome or at least least he will have any kind of developmental disability you will have to bear with all of it joanna was very sick premature with her lungs and with her eyes um she was always up and down one day there were days when i would go to that nicu and she would be fine and in few minutes i see her heart rate dropping down to single digits and as a mother you want to do everything to save your child but you stand there helpless asking lord lord where are you where are you in all these things why is my child suffering and why are you not here right in mark chapter 4 we say the same situation from verse 35 onwards where the disciples disciples are asking the lord lord are you not mindful of us why are you sleeping the storm is all around what are you doing and why are you sleeping you know it's the same thing i used to ask the lord lord where are you why are you doing what you're doing There were many times they called Port Blue for my daughter. And there was a particular night where we thought that she would never survive. A whole day and night, in spite of being ventilated, she was her oxygen saturation were in the 40s and the 30s, where it has to be about 90s. And the doctors did not know what they could do. They did not know what was wrong. but later on it was like a technical difficulty and you know from their instrument and then they they were able to figure it out after after a lot of prayer we never thought that we would receive her you know i remember my husband praying that night because the doctor came and told us that if you believe that there is any super power or if you believe that there is like a god pray because he doesn't believe in it okay so he told us you know if you be because there's not nothing we can do for her and i remember my husband praying and saying lord as abraham placed isaac at the altar i place her at your altar if it's your will give her life whatever is your will let that happen it was so hard for me to hear that prayer and we laid them and we prayed for them and today you see them they are 10 and a half they'll turn 11 in april and i would say that it was god's abundant mercy and grace they are away. they are here alive they are well 
all the complications the doctors had predicted has thankfully not been in them and if you ask me how was the journey it was not a fun journey <laughs> and i don't wish it on anybody they were in the nicu for 108 days and we had so many ups and downs they were ventilated for a month on cpap many days and they came with oxygen at home they were isolated from everybody for a year the church saw them at their first birthday so you know what all we went through for a year um so why do I say all these things? I say this, you know, before we, I'm about to conclude and, um, you know, in all these things, um, we have seen the hand of God and the faithfulness of God's hand. And that is what I want to testify today. Wherever we are, whatever we are, if we submit our lives to God, God is faithful and he is able to deliver each one of us from every circumstances or every situation each one of us are in. When we call upon his name, Bible says he will answer you. He might not answer you in the way you want him to answer you, but he answers you. So when you call upon his name, he will answer you. That is an assurance given by you. You know, your family may fail you. Your husband might fail you. You know, your people around you, your church members might not understand you. They might say, what is this person going through? Why is this person? You know, we have heard from many people. Why is it suffering after suffering after suffering for these people? And today I stand here. I could not testify before you if we would have not gone through all of all what we went through. And then the doctor said that you know I, I could not have a child after them because of the all the complication I had and you know we had a third baby and we had her full term and she's a miracle in spite of all what the doctors said and all the impossibilities they said in spite of taking all the medicines I was taking for the heart and things like that where my doctors thought that you know she would have some disability she came as a full-term baby healthy and we have to be lost three god gave us back all three so my husband whenever he testifies he says you know we have six children three in heaven and three here and i thank and praise god for all his wondrous work he has done in our life before i conclude i would like to read mark chapter 4 verses 35 to 41 we are very familiar with the passage and um, this is something the Lord inspired in my heart as I was praying for my testimony today morning. On the day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was and other boats were with him and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is very familiar chapter with for all of us. And we know the scripture portion. Just as I said from my life, I asked the Lord as we went through many difficult times, Teacher, Lord, do you not care for us? If anybody who is hearing me, you're asking the same question to God. It might be your health. It might be your child. It might be difficult times at work. It might be your visa situation. I don't know what you're going through. But if that's you, the Lord is saying, be still, have some faith. I'm right here. Bible says, fear not, for I am with you. And he says that he will be with us till the ends of the ages. He did not say, I'll be with today and not tomorrow, right? 
there are times in our life when we go through difficult times we are just like the disciples though we walk with him though we hear from him though we are anointed by the holy spirit we still ask him lord do you not care and that's what i asked him lord where are you in all these things do you not care for me that i have be i have to go through all of these things and that's where you hear god still voice which says i am right here have some faith and do not be afraid whatever is your situation whatever difficult situations you are going through in life today i want to assure you from the word of god and from the testimony that god is faithful when we are not he said i will not leave you and never forsake you and he will never leave you nor forsake you the questions i asked i have an answer today i asked the lord where are you and what is my purpose through all what we went through God enable me to take our second masters from here. I have a masters in psychology and counseling and I'm counseling people for the past one and a half years. And today I stand before you and I tell you all what I have gone through. God is using it mightily for his glory. God is helping me to touch lives. God is helping me to heal lives only because for what i have gone through bible says if the kernel of wheat doesn't fall down and be crushed it will not yield fruit if you are a gardener you know if a seed doesn't fall down and it doesn't lose its shape and size and its beauty you will not see a beautiful plant coming from it So today I want to encourage each of you if you are broken you feel lord this is the end of my life and I don't know what I have to do anymore I want to encourage you by saying that there is a reason why you are crushed today there is a reason why you are broken today so that you will produce fruit and the fruit shall be beneficial for many other people to come to the kingdom of God I thank and praise God for all what we have gone through because through all these things I stand today as the testament of God's unfailing love and kindness and faithfulness. I do not stand today because I have any merit or I was capable. God has been using me in places because he has taken me through areas and places where I was crushed and broken so I could be used for his glory. I thank and praise God for this opportunity to share my testimony and give glory to God. I pray that this will be an encouragement for each of you and that um, wherever, what whatever stages in life and spiritual life you are that he will enlighten you reform you and revive you to be more closer to you praise god